Welcome to Entrepreneurial Reality with Bash. Every week we'll be speaking to startup and scale up founders to learn about them, their ambitions for the business, goals and objectives. Every conversation is a moment in time, documenting entrepreneurs' current situation with a view to coming back next year to see how they are getting on. Each journey will be different. Each innovation could be game changing. I hope you enjoy. So Entrepreneur Reality with Bash, Series 1, Episode 15. I have with me today, Ash Day. Welcome. Hi, Ben. Thanks for having me today on the show. You're welcome. So you're the founder and CEO of a company called Open Mind Wellbeing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, Open Mind Wellbeing is essentially a B2B platform connecting well-being professionals with workplaces with the with the intention of helping employers unlock their well-being agendas their well-being programs to empower their employees to be their best selves essentially and emotionally and i very much believe that yoga meditation and mindfulness are practices that can can help on that journey as well it also then manages the end-to-end administration, which is the biggest burden for, for workplaces in, in going out to find wellbeing professionals to come into the workplace, such as, firstly, how, how do you go about finding a yoga teacher or meditation guide? How do you know they're certified and qualified? And importantly, are they insured if one of your employees potentially injures themselves? Who is liable for that? So the vetting process, the administration of booking registration is, is key. The other element is employee engagement and the employee registration and the employee administration. So great companies have figured out a way to host a session. But the the problem is how do you actually engage your employees? So what we're hoping to do and what we plan to do as part of the platform and the offering is to provide tailored content to individual workplaces with their branding across different mediums to supply that information to their employers, to the person booking the session to spread the word internally in their world. So engagement's key. The platform then is also used for the employee registration. So once you've got the session booked, you've engaged with your workforce and uh, publicized and marketed what sessions as a workplace you want to put on, employees can go into the platform and then book. And then finally, it's all about feedback and reporting. So feedback from the employees, the employers, the wellbeing professionals, we we, we collect some of that feedback back. And then we use some of that reporting back to the employer to say, this is why investing in yoga, meditation and mindfulness is good business sense. This is what your employees are saying. These are, this is the direct feedback we've had from your employees, and this is the business case for it. This is why it's worth investing money into it. Mm-hmm. So that's a bit of a long-winded um, explanation, but I just wanted to cover the fact that it's not just a marketplace. It doesn't just connect workplaces with well-being professionals. It takes the pain points out along the way for both the well-being professionals in terms of time administration, travel, finding local work for them, as well as for the employers. <laughs> who are time poor on the whole because they've got day jobs and on the whole they don't have dedicated resources to focus on building out and finding resources for yoga meditation mindfulness so we just want to take all the pain out of it and do it for for them and so who would you call your customers then our core advocate in, in the workplace are the employees number one they, they will have a voice they have an idea of what they want Within the platform itself, we give the opportunity for them, whether their employer is registered with us or not at that point, to have their voice to say, we'd love to do this, we'd like to do this, here's why. And we, we collect some of that. And that gives us a, a compelling a case to go have a conversation with our core customer, which is the, the buyer, the person in an organisation that holds budget and influence. That could be anyone from the head of HR to a team leader, a team manager. Because essentially, if you have employees under you, you have a responsibility to look after their well-being. Therefore, we're not just targeting heads of HR. And and, and today, actually, a number of workplaces have heads of well-being, heads of people, uh, looking at all levels uh, to be our voices, to be our ambassadors for for change here. What is the particular problem that you see? Uh, What are you looking to solve? Having come from a corporate background and worked across 
numerous organisations and workplaces over the last six six years or so. The topic of mental health, um, well-being in the workplace has grown. So it's 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 cited today that one in four people experience mental health problems each year in the UK, um, and and that equates to about six hundred thousand individuals, probably more, actually more than that, um, out of work each year due to mental health problems which has a humongous impact on both the UK economy, workplaces and the individuals themselves. And interestingly, the time is very much right now because it's in the public domain. People are talking about mental health. People are talking about individual well-being. The workplace has changed so much. There's companies and charities like Heads Together, uh, Mental Health at Work, which is spearheaded by the, the royal family, and other charities like Head Talks and Calm, and, and This Can Happen, which are really bringing to the forefront the conversation about mental health. It was only last month that there was the largest gathering in the UK, in London, hosted by a charity called This Can Happen, that brought in, I believe, 120 companies and 750 delegates across London to one place to talk about mental health and well-being in the workplace. So that's the core core problem. Um, I believe that they, everyone should at least have the opportunity to feel their best self physically, mentally and emotionally. And as we spend the majority of our, our days at work, there should be some accountability from employers to factor some offerings within the workday for their employees. Delve into a little bit more detail around the platform, the technology, the building of that. In a little while. Let's go back to how you got here in the first place. I'm going to take a few steps further back than just starting at the workplace, mainly because I think five key points over the last six, six, seven years that have led me to where I am today. Um, and the latter point being the actual workplace itself. And it goes back to following my degree, actually, in chemistry. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, like most, most people after university. Um, so I thought I'll, I'll continue chemistry. I ha- had in mind going to start a PhD, but I actually decided to take part in, the, uh, in, a, in a walk because uh, I, I love the outdoors. I love hiking. I find it a great way to clear my, clear my mind. And I heard something, something called the Camino de Santiago, which is a walk from France all the way across northern Spain. And essentially that, that walk was a great way for me to talk to people from but essentially all walks of life, teachers, doctors, there were a few investment bankers, there were a few um, yoga teachers I met, there were teachers, nurses, any, any profession you could imagine, I, I, I seem to have talked, spoke to, whether it was a five minute conversation or walk for days, hearing people's backgrounds. But the reason I mentioned this as a turning point was because it was this trip during one of the days in sunny northern Spain, um, I was introduced to someone who introduced yoga to me and it was the very first time I did a downward dog on the grass <laughs> tried a, 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 a something called pigeon and this is where these were these were just foreign names to me and I didn't really understand what pigeon and downward dog were at the time so I, I, I didn't really take any note of it from there on and uh, I continued on I came back to reality I came back to to the UK following that and I was still, still a bit unsure what I wanted to do and I decided I know for sure I don't want to stay in chemistry and be lab based because it just didn't fit my personality of being out there building relationships and talking to people, which is very much who, who I am through and through. Picturing me working in a lab, potentially not talking to anyone all day while pipetting some, something in a, in a test tube just didn't really appeal to me at that time. <laughs> um, so it led me on a, on a journey and I moved from thinking about chemistry to jumping into technology. So I moved to a company called Atos. And in that organization, I did service delivery management. So this is my first exposure to the real workplace. Uh, I was managing a complex outsource IT managed service um, agreement for, for Atos uh, in the manage, uh, manufacturing and retail sector. It was a very high pressure job, long hours, at any moment in, in the night or day, I was on call, so I could get a call from the customer saying, oh, our email's broken, help, because that's how one of our core um, pieces of equipment in, uh, to, for our business to win. Can you, can you imagine if, if your email didn't work, Ben, and you relied on your email for day-to-day work, internal engagements? It, it's a huge thing for a business. Mm. Working in that 
job and that environment just meant high stress, high, um, you're working all the time, you don't really get a lot of time to wind down because potentially you could get a call. But at the same time, it was a great way for me to learn. I transitioned to technology with minimal understanding of the IT infrastructure world. It also gave me a chance to engage with stakeholders, everyone from the delivery folks on the ground who tirelessly work long hours to make sure the, the business runs and operates, all the way to the, the, the CIO of that particular organization. So I, I met the breadth of an organization there. That was great. For me, I was looking for the ways, how, did I, how could I find a way to manage my own stress? Because working those hours, working under that pressure and those time constraints and the knowledge of if something needs fixing, we need to get it fixed as soon as possible. Otherwise, there's potential huge business risk for that customer. Um, how did I unwind? And that's where I remembered back to that Sunday afternoon in Spain and that trying yoga. And speaking to others following this in, in recent years is that first step into a yoga studio. As a, as a man who had been introduced to yoga before, I felt comfortable I could walk into that yoga studio and not feel self, self-conscious. self I know many other uh, of my friends who, who are male and who were put off by going to yoga studio first because, one, they didn't know what to do. They were worried about being the only guy in the yoga studio. Why would I want to do that? What was the benefits for me? People didn't really understand, or I didn't understand even at that time, what the benefits for me. So this is turning point number three, where I found a local yoga studio to my workplace. Um, and actually, it's called Yoga Haven in, in Angel. They were essentially the start of my yoga community. And I, I mentioned this because community in London, in the, in the well-being space, is very close everyone knows everyone and it's a huge part of our community and platform we're building is that community element i'll come back to that a bit later so while i was working at atos i I decided to have a career leap and move from delivery to consulting and i joined a company called accenture which was a fantastic place to work they really empowered their employees to think about their own well-being Uh, there is a um uh, an interest group available to all employees called Mental Health Allies Programme, which is very much encouraging and empowering everyone, every employee in Accenture to be aware of their mental health, have access to mental health uh, ally training, which is basically a way for you to be able to understand the signs of poor mental health in yourself and in others, and then act as a signpost and a guide to them. So everyone becomes each other's support system, which I hadn't ever seen in a workplace before. And since then, conversation after conversation and speaking to workplace after workplace, I can see that Accenture was ahead of the times in that case. And it's becoming more of the norm now and more companies are starting these mental health uh, slash core well-being agendas to try and ch- change internally. But Accenture was the, the fourth turning point in where while I was there, I was consulting I didn't necessarily have the opportunity to go to my local studio anymore because I could be potentially on a client site on the other side of the country. My a friend I made, um, a colleague at the time at Accenture, um, and I connected somehow on our internal social media and said, let's create, a, let's create a yoga community in the workplace. And that was essentially the start of something quite special where over two years, well, over the, over the first year, we, we grew our community. And then over the second year, uh, I, I led the community as, as my colleague left the company and also trained to be a yoga teacher herself. But we grew to 550 active employees engaging in yoga meditation in the workplace. And it was, it was great. So over two years, we hosted over 100 sessions. Over two years, we hosted sessions not only in, in offices, but we hosted them over Skype to allow remote workers, home workers, to be also involved and included into this offering. Because it's often that home workers or remote workers, especially in a consulting environment where you're at the office a lot, miss out on a lot of the wellbeing uh, opportunities. So we were really proud of what we built there and, um, and made available to everyone. So they're essentially the, the, the four key points. The fifth key point is actually taking the leap 
moving from full-time employment in a secure job to becoming uh, the founder of Open Mind Wellbeing. And that took a number of factors in itself to, to make that decision. So what were they? How did you come to that decision? It wasn't an easy decision. Uh, and uh, Running the yoga community in Accenture for, for two years is kind of evidence of why it wasn't an easy decision and a quick decision. Um, and there were a number of factors. In the job I was doing, I was learning a lot about product delivery, service-centric operating and operating model designs. And that's what I consulted on, which actually has a pretty much identical comparison to how you start a startup, how you go about building a product, how you go about building a minimum viable product and prototype and testing. Over those two years, I gained a huge amount of experience in agile, uh, agile delivery and service delivery, which made it feel comfortable to to make that jump and I, I know from speaking to other founders where they've not had that experience it's quite a hard thing to grasp building an mvp is it's basically you're, you're building a prototype uh, a version of your product at the worst it's ever going to be because it's just to prove the concept and then you scale and grow from that the the second point was the yoga community Having spent so much time practicing yoga in studios, practicing in Hyde Park on the grass or Clapham Common in, in the summer, having then actually brought the yoga community into the workplace was a great experience for both myself, but also hearing from the yoga community themselves and what they found, and also the employees and the impact it had. And the support system that was there was something I wasn't expecting until I, I got to that stage. Importantly, timing. So while we ran the community for two years, the perception of mental health in the workplace had changed so much over those two years. And that might have just been my exposure to it, but also seeing on social media, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, the BBC News, the, the perception and attitudes of mental health in individuals as well as in the workplace, had changed so much. And as I mentioned, that's due to various champions and charities driving that forward. So they, they were the big three elements that helped me make the decision. The other one was I had to change my own attitude. Um, and coincidentally, over that period, I read a couple of books, which I think had a, a more of an impact on my life than I probably realised at the time. And one of them was Matthew Saeed's uh, black box thinking and that was all about attitude to failure and how it compared the aviation industry to the medical industry in terms of learning from mistakes errors failures it's it's a learning point it's not necessarily a failure as long as you learn something from it um, and prevent something from happening again or making something get better so that that changed something in me that alongside agile methodology and delivery where it's all about learn fast and fail fast kind of went hand in hand the other thing that changed my thinking and this was I must have read this only six six months ago if not that was Simon Sinek's Start With Why and that was a book that really got me thinking about while I love my job while I'm, I'm good at consulting I have really good relationships with my clients etc cetera, etc cetera, am I truly passionate about it and this is where I sound probably like a true millennial in the fact that I, I want to do something I'm passionate about. Has it got a sense of purpose for me? Am I motivated by it daily? And I love problem solving and consulting ticks some of those boxes. But since moving into Open Mind full time, it's a completely different feeling. We're mid-December and I started Open Mind full time on the 1st of October. So we're, we're a couple of months in now. So very early. So you've got the idea. You can see the opportunity. You've kind of tested the market already indirectly at Accenture. Mm -hmm. Now you need to go and build the product. How did you go about doing that? So the first month of being full-time on this, um, I realized I don't know everything and I need help. Um, so I, I made the decision, I need to find a partner of some sort, where it, it, whether that was going down the incubation hub, an accelerator, uh, an individual developer, a CTO slash product partner, a digital agency, the list goes on. And I, um, I, I compiled over 70 plus potential partners to talk to about how, who can help me build my idea, my vision here. And I, I whipped it down to a shortlist. There were a number of factors, again, 
you're probably gathering I'm quite logical and systematic here in yes. terms of my thinking. Uh, but I had a I had a spreadsheet with all of these on, and um, I whittled it down to a, com- to a couple of companies. But one that stood out was some, um, someone called YouCreate, uh, based in London. The reason they stood out for me was their experiences and success rates of being able to build startup organizations and then scale them was number one. Number two was actually the relationship I had with them. So partner made to call the boxes on paper, but do I get on with them day to day? And that was a huge, huge factor. As I was self-investing in, in, the, in the development of the MVP, could I find a partner who would actually help me build a product that I wanted to build, but also challenge me constantly um, from a product perspective, what's best by the customer. I didn't want a partner that will just listen to me and build whatever I say, because being being the founder of it, I am hugely biased to what I think is right. And I wanted that objective view. Also, um, Matt, the CEO of Create, was really passionate about the idea and the, the social impact it potentially has on individuals across well, across wherever wherever our product may touch in the future. So today were the key key factors. So um, we're doing a twelve week sprint plan, and we're four weeks in, in into that sprint plan now. So by by January mid January we will have our MVP. And in terms of customers, uh, you, you've got as a platform. You mentioned the businesses the employees, also the practitioners. Mm -hmm. How are you going about building those communities and bringing them together? So community is such a key key part of an ethos and value of what I'm trying to build here. The, The reason being is while we work with workplaces and employees, an employee might be introduced to yoga, meditation or mindfulness in the workplace. And we would have facilitated the connection of a local well-being professional practitioner to their local workplace. So that's great. We've created a local connection there, local community. We're basically connecting uh, the well-being community. And in the workplace, we call them networks. So networks of colleagues and um, contacts, but essentially it's a community. So we're connecting those communities. The bit I really am passionate about is, great, once we've done that connection that employee then goes i want to do this outside of the workplace where can i go and i i really want to get to the point where we can then signpost employees to local uh, studios and centers for yoga meditation mindfulness where we have the opportunity of already having that relationship with that studio so that's part of the community aspect where they then can find that same local teacher they really like from the workplace in the, in the, potentially in the local studio as well. So that's one element. The, the other element is I fully recognize that yoga, meditation, mindfulness isn't everyone's cup of tea and will take some time for people to get used to it over, over time. And this is where our approach is a, a non-dogmatic approach to yoga, meditation, mindfulness. We, we, don't, we will encourage our teachers not to speak in Sanskrit, for example. We will, work, we will ask our teachers to work with the workplaces and do what's best, we'll do what they'd like, essentially. And there'll be that open dialogue and discussion. I mentioned earlier the, the Royal Foundation um, set up by Prince William was it's called the mental health at work and that's a website of resources and toolkits to help with mental health so while we are a well-being business facilitator connecting well-being professionals related to yoga meditation mindfulness we don't do everything we don't so i want the opportunity to signpost um employees to other resources they can find because this this is also some some employees are more advanced in this than others some have started that journey of making um, well-being resources, mental health resources accessible in the workplace to employees. Where they're not that advanced in, in that journey yet, we're the starting point, for, point. We're essentially a signpost as well as part of that community. So I, I very much believe the studios, local charities, local retailers as well, accessibility to our services is very important. So we're keeping our price point low. But if a organization then wants to buy yoga mats for their employees to use in the workplace, how can we make sure they get the best deals possible? So making these uh, partnerships with, with retailers 
to help them find the best price possible so they're they're not overspending and using all their budget on actual equipment rather than delivering something active for their employees that will actually allow their employees to build healthy habits. Sorry, again, another long-winded answer because there's lots of elements to each answer. <laughs> no, of course. Well, it's good that you're covering every point. Thank you. And in relation to the, your competitors, uh, that you're a platform for wellness, well-being. Uh, you've got practitioners that are providing services such as yoga. What do you see as your unique selling point? There's a couple, actually. So... I mentioned it, our platform, and there's currently for yoga, meditation, and mindfulness, there isn't a platform that does the connection in terms of a marketplace of, of those businesses. That marketplace is twofold. One is, I want a yoga teacher, search on a yoga teacher. Many workplaces are in the position where I know I need to do something. I want to achieve these outcomes. How do I get to there? And I think... Building that as part of a search gives employers another way of finding and having access to yoga, meditation, mindfulness without having to know what they need right there and there. The, the key, the, the bit that's so valuable and having managed the community and spoken to lots of companies already is a lot of people are time poor. Um, those who run these sessions in workplaces do it on a voluntary basis. It's not part of their day job. The, the end-to-end managed administration is the huge selling point of our platform. The way I compare it to other uh, competitors is where there are hundreds and thousands of yoga meditation apps out, out there. Um, there's companies like Headspace, which are brilliant, Simple Habits, another brilliant meditation mindfulness app. But where companies provide those for their employees, they basically say, Here's access to an app, which can help you from an introduction to meditation, yoga, and mindfulness. But they're basically saying, do it on your own time. There's minimal actual commitment to do it in working hours. What I'm passionate about is saying, we need to have that conversation with workplaces and provide these sessions in, working, in the working day. So 20 minutes in the working day, potentially. The administration, the connection, and making it accessible so once you, you've got a client, what's the benefit of continuing using you rather than going direct to the practitioner in the future? Again, it's the, the benefit of using Open Mind Wellbeing as, as, as a platform is we manage all the administration. We make sure our wellbeing professionals are properly vetted. And, and that's an important perspective from are they actually qualified to lead and teach their particular service? Are they insured? It's also all the administration behind it. A lot of people think running, hosting a session in the workplace probably doesn't, from the sound of it, doesn't sound like a lot of administration. But you've got the actual booking process, the payment process of the actual person, the employee engagement, the employee registration, the employee booking onto that process. Um, it, it's, it's, it's quite a long list of, of activities. And those who have done this in the workplace understand that it takes considerable considerable amount of time. Um, the other element is feedback and reporting is key. So one thing we want to do is have an open dialogue with anyone that comes into contact with Open Mind, whether that be ad hoc feedback surveys, whether that be how did you feel before the session and how did you feel after with some both qualitative and quantitative measures there. The reason we want to capture some of this is because then we can – on behalf of the employees, have the conversation with the, the employer, our customer, to say this is justification to invest in yoga, meditation, mindfulness for the benefit of your employees, which in turn has the benefit on your organization as a whole from an employee morale perspective, productivity, efficiency, and actually staff attraction and retention, and, and, and which also leads to reduced sickness and due to stress and burnout. So you've got the... MVP, the, the market viable product plan to be released sort of mid-January. What would be your next 12 months plan? What's your expectation? So um, during, during January, we'll be piloting with a number of customers and hosting a variety of sessions in those workplaces and essentially running our pilot and MVP and learning from our, our users. From that, it's really taking that feedback and then building uh, out our platform further so for that 
investments needed. So one of the key things once we've proven our concept is to further our conversations with with investors. So we're looking for about 250k in investment uh, from from angels potentially to basically continue that product development. So for the MVP, much of the back end is still manual. In the future, with investment, part of that investment being used on development, that will go into automating much of the back end, if not uh, to a point where we'll, it'll be fully automa- automated. Um, we'll also get to the point where we're ready to start scaling this. So how do we provide all workplaces the opportunity to use our platform? Uh, so for that, um, investment into branding, marketing is, is needed. And just, just as something that's just popped into my mind, and I think it's worth worth saying is that's the next 12 months are very much focused on user feedback, investment, uh, scaling, and marketing and branding. The ethos is all around community and accessibility. And that's not just in terms of all workplaces should have access to this, but it's in terms of affordability is part of accessibility. Keeping our price point of our sessions as low as possible is a selling point for us, mainly because in the past, teachers have been able to go into workplaces and charge whatever they wanted to charge, essentially, because companies were none the wiser. We've standardized that rate at the lowest possible price rate, where it's still an incentive for wellbeing professionals to go and work in workplaces, and actually workplaces feel a benefit from investing that money and not feeling shortchanged, essentially. And that essentially then continues to ongoing repeat sessions for for that same price. So for the benefit of future investors, then, where are you going to monetize? How are you going to make your money? So in terms of monetization, there are a number of future elements we want to build into the platform. But from the start, it's um, a 20% uh, margin on each of the sessions that are hosted. Um, in the future, um, and this will be very much based on user feedback, is once you're engaged in a, in a work workplace, how do you keep the employees engaged on an ongoing basis? How do you prevent employees registering to come to a session and actually turning up? So even from the proof of concept, sorry, the community we ran in Accenture, we noticed that out of a, so occasionally on classes, people would register and not turn up. So something we want to try out in the future is potentially looking at a one pound accountability fee for actual employees taking part in in, in using our services. And this is as much for the employer as well as us and for them. It's basically holding them accountable and committing to, I've registered a class, I will turn up, rather than registering a class and not turning up and taking that spot from someone else who might actually want it. Using those funds, uh, as well as um, a potential uh, a percentage of, of profits, we want to give back to our community. As we, we're, we're a, a for profit, but we are community centric still. One of the things I said earlier was all workplaces, and that includes non profits, schools, uh, ch- charities as part of the non profits should have access to services like this. So what something we want to do once we've grown a little bit is provide these same services to nonprofits at a heavily discounted rate or free using some of the proceeds of, of that. Okay, so organi- organizations that may not necessarily have the space to host such events, how do you overcome that? Um, again, twofold. So that will either be, we, we can offer services by a, uh, remote session, so over Skype, over Zoom, where uh, where employees actually have to also get changed into active wear. They can do things at their desk. So we call it desk side yoga, desk side meditation, where we can engage with uh, employees at their desks. The other side is uh, where workplaces don't have the space to host a session in the office, we can help find local space to host a session. Um, in the, in the, to just add on that, in the future, that will be something post MVP we'd build into the platform. But for MVP, it's not something that's there. Okay. And in terms of the lessons you've learned to date, uh, for the benefit of the listeners, which one would you would you like to share? 
coming from a consulting background, having actually delivered against processes and agile delivery is trust the process. Even as a founder, I know the process, having experienced it and delivered it and being a product manager in the past, essentially, trusting the process is really, really hard <laughs> um, because I'm so passionate about the about doing this and I believe so much in it and I kind of just want to accelerate it and go, go, go. But my, and this is where uh, my product manager, Francis, that you create is, remind me, Ash, you know the process, you've delivered this, trust it. Um, you know what you're going to get at the end of the day. And we'll, we'll, and the, the second fold of that is listen to your users because that's part of the process and build something that actually means something and is useful to your users. I, I've got a whole list of uh, lessons, actually, and th- things that I think are key, but I think they're the, they're the two main ones. Well, if you've got a couple more, please share. This is the whole point of uh, sharing and collaborating and learning. Okay, so one of the other ones, and I think it's put me in very good stead all my career so far, is relationship and community. So when I joined that yoga community at Yoga Haven, the yoga studio, looking back, I wouldn't have realized, well, at that point of joining that community, I wouldn't have realized how important it would be for my, where I am now. And that's not why you should do something, but community relationships are so important for our own well-being as well, as well as trying to grow a business. The other side is every project I've worked on in my technology career, all those relationships matter. Um, having worked at many of the financial services organizations, well, a number of them in London, it's their connections and relationships I've built and can foster into can they can they be my entry point for open mind while being into their companies? Can they help me with an introduction? Every relationship matters. Every every and that means the whole community matters. Yes, I think I think they're, they're the main ones. I'll, I'll leave it there, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I can go on, but no, I think they're the main ones for me. And trust trust the process. Listen to your users. Relationship, community. Don't be afraid to learn. There you go. I've added another one at the end there. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so in, in the process of your very early stages of, of entrepreneurial reality and life and journey, uh, are there any particular influencers, business owners, investors that you look towards and, and want to, to emulate or replicate or uh, take from? and see in yourself how can you achieve even a modicum of success compared to them? See, I've been asked this question before. I I, I really struggle picking one person, mainly because I think we live in an age where now people aren't afraid of trying new things. There are entrepreneurs and innovators everywhere. And it's just that don't be afraid to fail aspect. I think that's something that's key across all them for entrepreneurs. I, so I, I don't think I can name one person or put my finger on one person because I think there's there's um, influence and vloggers like Jay Shetty, who's communicated the word of, um, it's, it's just a, a, he's a motivational speaker talking about empowerment in the day-to-day and the impact of little things on your day-to-day. And he's, he, he's come from a background of consulting. He was a, an, a, an urban monk and now he's working at the Huffington Post and has his own his own vlog and has huge multi million individual following and it's just amazing to see how using technology using social media he's built his community his his career and his he's sharing his messages and the messages of just positivity essentially and that's an amazing thing to see in comparison to the pure tech startups and uh, um, which is completely different to that world. <laughs> yes, yes, but they all share some common traits, as you said, about not mm. not being afraid to fail and trying things and doing things. And it's the doing that's the important bit, isn't it? Because if you don't, nothing's going to happen. Exactly. Um, someone needs to be the driver of that change. And and again, it's even even with open mind. It's thinking, why has no one done this before? Why don't I do that? What, wait, a minute, wait a minute, why don't I do that? And that's again that journey of 
let's do let's let's get started and it, it took me a while to get to that point and i think that was part of, part of the reasons i mentioned earlier but it's just at some point i think something clicks and you just go and that's where i am now i'm just let's do, let's go ahead with this we, it, can, it will work um i've seen the benefits every person i've spoken to there's no one that loses out in what we're trying to offer. And as I mentioned it, the employee, the employer, the wellbeing professional, the local studios, the community as a whole, everyone benefits from this. Uh, just a, a little bit more about yourself. You, you're a very keen practitioner of yoga. Are there any other particular ways in which you get a clear mindset, uh, taking time away from, from building your business? So... While uh, while the business is all around yoga, meditation, and, and and mindfulness, I very much believe that we all get stressed. Um, it's a very normal aspect of day to day life. So while while my business is focused about, about that, it's not all I do to unwind de stress. Um, and I think everyone's different, and everyone needs to find what works for them to help them manage stress. So for me, yoga and um, mindfulness practices are key. But in the past, it, I've been a, a keen long-distance runner and having, having done an ultramarathon quite a few years back now. It's funny how time flies, but that was a 100-kilometer <laughs> run, about 60 miles run in one go. And, and actually, for me, and as part of my journey to get into where I am, actually, that was one of the very first times I became truly mindful in, and when it was when I was running, where it, I didn't actually notice. Well, I noticed the the landing of each step on the ground, the feeling of how the ground felt. You could hear your breath, and you were just completely in that zone. Because I was running for over ten hours, which is a hard thing to think about now. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, I think everyone's different. So now, so running is one aspect of how I unwind and de-stress and keep active, yoga, meditation, hit classes. But I also just making a, love making a cup of tea and watching some TV just to just mush my brain to mush, turn my brain into mush and then go away, let it rewire. And uh, I think I think that's a good thing too. There's a question I'd like to ask you every year. And uh, hopefully the lessons you learned across the year, your answer will become different as a result. So what, what would you do differently knowing what you know now? So that's, a, that's always a hard one, mainly because I think all my experiences have led me to where I am now. Should I have started earlier? Um, I would say, it, looking back at it now, probably not. The timing wasn't right. Should I have used a different tech partner? Um, I believe not because everything with you, Crate, and, and Matt and the team have been absolutely fantastic in the way we work, our relation, working relationship, our mm-hmm. shared goal and what we believe in. We believe in building a product that serves our users. And I don't know, it's too hard at this stage to say, would I do anything differently? Because I, I, I tend to learn from everything I do. If it works, if it doesn't work, um, what have I learned from it? How would I do something differently? And I don't think I've come across enough of those yet because each one of those influenced me into making the decision that's led me to where I am. But we're only a couple of months in, so I look forward to answering that question in a year's time to see, or whenever it may be, to see what I say then. Yeah, it's great. And there's a lot happens in 12 months in the world of a startup. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot to share. Indeed, indeed. Yes, Ash, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your insights. And I, I wish you every success uh, with the, the journey ahead and your your platform, Open Mind Wellbeing. Thank you very much, Ben. And it's been very good as well for me just to share my thoughts and thinking. And uh, again, it's going to be interesting to hear and listen back to this recording at a future date and see, see where we fall. Yes, great. So what do you think? We'll have another interesting story to dive into next week. Looking forward to it already. Some questions to you in the meantime. What is your story? What is your reality right now? And what are you working towards? Let me know. So you can connect with me on Twitter. Just type in Bash in the search and you'll find me. So Bash, B-A-S-H. Easy. 
On Instagram, it's bash reality. So that's bash underscore reality. And on LinkedIn, Benjamin Ashmore. Make sure you subscribe and until next week, cheers. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.